Welcome to To The Point. We started this program 20 years ago this week, and later in the show, we'll look back at that first year some two decades ago. But first, what's happening now? The legislature is careening towards an early adjournment, and the governor still has some big action items she wants to see passed. This week, she talked about a couple of those issues and the prospects of them being passed. Governor, let's talk about what has been a remarkable session uh, so far. We've talked a little bit about the amount of legislation that was passed early on, Democratic priorities. You made a speech this summer, What's Next? You talked about several things, and one of them was energy. And it was about making sure that Michigan is on a path for renewable energy and that we kind of lead that charge a little bit. Those bills have been discussed but not finalized. And because of what we're going to talk about at the end of this uh, block and, and the uncertainty about how long sessions are going to go, tell me where you think you are with those energy bills. I think we're making progress. I'm really excited. I think Michigan can be a leader, not only because it's you know, the right, smart thing to do as we look at what's happening with climate, what's looking at happening with our economy as we pitch Michigan. Companies want clean energy sources. It is a part of the regular conversation as well as workforce, which is why investments like we've made in our workforce and building up community are just as important as our policies around clean energy, reliability, making it more affordable. Um, all of these things I think are, are really important as we think about growing our population and growing our economy. When you look at those energy bills and they would do a lot of things depending on what they finally look like and I, I stipulate now that they are not fine. So one of the things that might well happen is that natural gas would be eliminated as a source for generation of electricity. But I'm unclear about what happens to natural gas in total because generating electricity is one thing, firing up my furnace at home is quite another thing. So what is your take on that? Well, listen, you know, as we talk about what a 100% clean energy standard is, what does it include? Some people would suggest it should only include solar and wind. That's not a real strategy though that is gonna help us meet our needs and permit you know, uh, research and development for newer, different types of, of energy sources. Natural gas is it's cleaner than, than other sources and it's a part of, I think, a robust ecosystem of making sure we've got the ability to meet everyone's energy needs and as we transition to cleaner and cleaner energy with a pretty aggressive goal. One of the things that is related, or in my mind is related, was something that was in committee, had a little problem getting out of committee, and finally did get out of committee. And that is a, a bill, and you will help explain this if I get this wrong, but as I understand it, it would take as pertaining solar arrays and perhaps maybe even wind, um, and give the ability for the PSC to kind of green light where those would go, not the local authority. Is that accurate? And if it is, what do you say to the local authority? I think it is including local input. I think that's really important. We also know that right now, as we want to build out, whether it's economic development or it is siting for solar or wind, that we've got to have a process where we can move quickly. And um, this is, I, I think, one of those areas where if the Public Service Commission, with their expertise in this field, uh, has a heightened role that we are going to be in a position to ensure we've got local voices are a part of the a part of the decision making, but ultimately that we can move fast when there's an opportunity in front of us. Given our limited time, I'm going to have kind of a, a serious shift in the conversation. Another of the things that you talked about during your What's Next speech was reproductive health rights. We know that the ballot proposal that passed uh, last year made abortion accessible and legal in the state of Michigan. Your contention is that there are a bunch of regulations that have been in past over a number of years and that those still create barriers. Mm -hmm. That legislation too is ready to go in the house, I think. And so the question is, are there any protections left if all of those pass or do they, there need to be? Listen, you know, uh, what we're trying to do is ensure that the Roe standard continues. That was a, a, there has inherent protections in it. What we're trying to get rid of is all of the other stuff that has been introduced to create absolute barriers for a lot of people exercising a right that the people have overwhelmingly said we expect and we protect this right here in Michigan. These trap laws that have been enacted over decades 
create a barrier for a lot of a lot of people to take time off to think about your transportation to access and then be denied you know because of some arbitrary 24-hour waiting period is a full barrier for a lot of people and that's just one example of the many trap laws that have been enacted over time the only person who is in a position to make that determination is the woman not some legislature from 30 years ago who thought a 24-hour waiting period sounded good and that's part of why continuing to level these additional barriers is living up to the spirit of what the voters resoundingly said last year's election. You know this better than anyone as a leader um, in the House and in the Senate. It's all a numbers game. Mm -hmm. And you also know how narrow the margins are. And up until now, Democrats have been very good about sticking together and putting all 56 votes in the House, particularly where it seems to be a little bit more maybe tenuous. You lose one vote, and particularly on some of those reproductive health things where Republicans are not going to vote for them, that package doesn't move. Can you get those 56, Dem I mean, I know it's not up to you entirely, but you play a big role in those. Can you get those 56 Democrats and can you do it before the legislature adjourns? Well, first let me say, you know, my goal is always to have bipartisan support of the policy. This, I am the governor of Michigan. I'm not just the leader of the Democratic Party. I took an oath to the people of Michigan trying to every day, whether it's in the budgets that I sign, to the bills that I sign, to live up to that oath that I took. We've seen a lot of Republican support for a lot of the work that we've been able to do, even though people say that's the Democratic agenda. It's been a bipartisan effort. When it comes to reproductive health, we saw some people cross the, cross the aisle and vote to eliminate that 1931 law. So I'm always gonna try to work with people to ensure that the laws that we are enacting are real reflection of what the values are of the people of the state. That being said, you know, the Democrats have a one seat margin in both chambers. That's why after the election, I said, I don't want to hear anyone talking about a mandate, say this is an affirmation of the things that we ran on and we're going to, we are going to deliver on them. And that's exactly what we're doing. But we're also mindful of making a seat at the table for people with different viewpoints or different politics so that we are um, taking a step forward and it, you know, that is well informed and, and well intentioned. And so my goal is to have Republican support for these. Um, at the end of the day, it, every new law requires 56, 20, and 1. 56 votes in the House, 20 votes in the Senate, and one signature. Given that the makeup of the legislature may look much different in January, we know that there are two Democrats that are running for mayor. If either one of them gets elected, they will be sworn in in January. You will call for a special election as quickly as you can, but there'll be a presidential primary coming up pretty quickly. There's gonna be a lot of activity by those clerks affected in those areas, so I don't know exactly how fast that can happen. It's quite possible that you come back in January and you don't have 56. Then you have to have Republican votes. You know what it's like being in the minority, and you've heard the Republicans complain about being in the minority. How much of this do you have to get done now in the next however many weeks, given the legislature is going to adjourn early to get that presidential primary in place? How much do you have to get done now and how much can you count on getting done after the first? Well, let me start with this. The first 100 days of this session, this legislature has gotten more done than any other legislature in the last 20 years. That was in the first 100 days of this year. It's a huge credit to the Senate Majority Leader Winnie Brinks from this side of the state and Speaker Joe Tate from, from Southeast Michigan. I'm proud of the agenda, but I have no time to waste. Everyone knows that. I work hard, I expect everyone else to, and I move fast and I expect everyone else to, and they have been. There's not a, an artificial timeline that we've got to get such and such done by January 1. I'm always trying to move as quickly as we can and get as much accomplished. I don't have time to waste. I know got three more years as governor. I want to do everything that I can to make sure that Michigan's economy is diverse and strong, that our population is growing and we are on a trajectory of growth. That's my goal. And that's why I always move so fast. We'll see what happens with those two elections. As you said, I'll probably call special elections pretty quickly and, and make sure that the House is up to full speed. But you know, the last thing we want or need is to see chaos like we're seeing in Washington, D.C. right now. And so that's why I'm I'm proud to have the Michigan legislation as an example of um, a group of people that is working hard and getting things done. 
Despite the governor's stated goal of always having bipartisan bills, subsequent to our conversation, the final piece of the Reproductive Health Act and all of the energy bills we discussed passed the Senate on straight party line votes. Each passed with 20 Democrats voting in favor, 18 Republicans voting against. The question now is can the governor and Democratic leadership keep all 56 of their members together to support all of the bills the Senate will be sending to them? It becomes somewhat more urgent given the legislature is likely to adjourn either this coming week or the following week in order for the legislation moving the Democratic presidential primary to late February to go into effect early enough to let that vote happen. Up next, a Democrat who wants to replace Senator Debbie Stabenow in Washington. Hill Harper, next, To The Point. Welcome back to To The Point. Next year's race for the United States Senate will be one to watch, not just for its impact on the state, but for the balance of power in Washington. We've already introduced you to a number of people running here on this show. In the Democratic primary, actor and activist Hill Harper will face off with fellow Democrats, including Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin. We recently talked to him about why he's running. I want to start with the real basics and try to introduce you to people in West Michigan because while many of us have seen you on television and have heard your name, we don't know a lot about your background. You and I were talking about this before. You've been around some. You've uh, seen a lot of the country. How did you end up coming to Detroit? Ended up here in Michigan about seven years ago because fundamentally a really good government program we had that, that like some of the good ones we got rid of, unfortunately. So over a decade ago, Michigan used to have a tax incentive for media production. And I came here to do a few projects back to back to back, met some great people and some folks that I'd known from Harvard uh, when I was in grad school at Harvard had lived here and were from here and just reconnected with them. Uh, and uh, they kept telling me, man, you should get a place here, you should get a place here. And it did plant a seed at that time. At that time I didn't have kids. so. Uh, I planted a seed that said, when I have children, I want to raise them here because I'd rather have my kids turn out like folks in Michigan than folks in Hollywood. So um, I adopted my son in 2015, uh, obviously a huge life-changing time for me. And uh, right after that, 2016, I got a place here, moved here, made Michigan my home. Before that, you had been on the West Coast, on the East Coast, yes. in the center of the country. I mean, you had lived... Yeah, uh, I was I was born in Iowa yeah. and then ended up moving all over the place. And then my career, to be quite honest, sure. your career as an actor, you go where the work is. So, you know, it's taken me all over the world and all over the country. So after you had gone to college, after you got your degrees and you had been involved in putting together documentaries and acting and, uh, as I said, you were on CNN for a while. Um, now you come to this this place in the road where you're running for the United States Senate. And before we get to why, how did you get there? What, what, was, what was the kind of the motivation for you? Sure, sure, sure. So when I originally became an actor, I wanted to be like Harry Belafonte. I wanted to uh, have a career of real substance in the arts, but at the same time, marry that with my activism. Um, and one of my great joys was getting to, to meet him and do a fireside chat with him. And uh, in many ways, his mentorship and his encouragement has led me on a more uh, a aggressive political path. Uh, and certainly losing him recently was just a, a massive loss to, the, to, 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 I think, our society because he truly represents activism at its finest. And so for me, the journey of being an activist, an artist, a writer, you know, I've written four New York Times bestselling books. All of those books were about empowerment of some sort, solving a problem. My last book was called Letters to an Incarcerated Brother, talking about the mass incarceration crisis in our country. And so um, I've always wanted to have positive impact and legacy, no matter what I'm doing. And over the course of that journey, it's taken on uh, a more political focused turn because we see that our politics are broken. And so if you actually want to have uh, a positive impact on communities right now, um, you have to look at it through a political lens because folks are weaponizing so many things in a negative way politically 
then unless you're politically active, and, and, and this goes all the way through the idea of voting, you have to participate, you have to vote. We have to reclaim our democracy, and it's something that I'm willing to, to throw my hat in the ring to fight for and fight for people. As we sit here, the dysfunction in Washington is in full display. It sure is. And one of the things that people often ask me or say to me is, when will things get back to normal? And the sad fact of the matter is that this is the current normal. I mean, there is dysfunction um, on both sides of the aisle. There is. We, we have... We have um, people who, who don't communicate and who don't talk. Yes. So, you've decided to run for the U.S. Senate. It's a rare open seat. It will be um, a very interesting race to watch, and it's one that could, well, uh, end up, well, it will in some form, but it could be one of the more pivotal races in the balance of power. Absolutely. So, you've gotten into this race, and you, you laid out part of the why, but what is it you want to accomplish as you go around Michigan, talk to people yeah. and talk to them about this race, why are you telling them that you're the right choice? Well, a couple different things. That, that you know, that, that, that's a multifaceted sure. question, and I'll try to I'll try to walk through it. But I think the the crux of what you laid out at the beginning, the fact that Washington is broken, and there's dysfunction in both parties, and and you know, one thing that 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 I try to explain to folks when I'm talking to them that many don't realize is that when you go to Capitol Hill and you go visit sitting members of Congress and the U.S. Senate, there are a couple things that you notice that shouldn't be. And that's that every single one of them has three or four TVs going continuously on news. Are they sitting there reading something, working on something? No, by and large, four to six hours a day they spend on the phone raising money. So you combine the fact that folks are watching the news to figure out what they should do next or what they should say in social media. They're spending four to six hours a day raising money and we expect something to actually get done in favor of people. The other part of the time, they're taking meetings with lobbyists, special interests, and big corporate interests and making decisions through that frame and lens. There's no, there's, you know, it's not surprising that we've seen so much dysfunction now. That may be the new normal, as people call it, but I'm unwilling to accept that because what it's doing is destroying our democracy and it's destroying trust in our democracy because the fundamental thing we need, certainly, and this is what I hear from Michiganders all across the state because one beautiful thing about running for Senate, I vowed that I would visit all 83 counties before the end of this year. And so I'm pretty far into that, uh, uh, but I still have a few to go. Uh, but all the way from Sault Ste. Marie, to Benton Harbor, to Muskegon, to Grand Rapids, to Bay City, to Saginaw, to Flint, to Detroit, to Marquette, to Petoskey, to Traverse City, you hear the same thing. How come our Washington representatives aren't representing us? And how come I only see them when they, when they need my vote and I don't see them again? And how come I don't have any real way of connecting with them? Why aren't I represented? in a real way. Why don't I feel that representation? And for me, um, you know, I don't come out of a career in government. I come out of a much more private sector minded person. I believe in economic development. I believe that if you don't create jobs and you don't pay living wage and you don't have strong unions, then you can't have highly functioning communities. And so those are some of the things I want to fight for that I believe we aren't seeing folks in Washington fight for. What we're seeing is vitriol, uh, division, and folks that aren't willing to put people first. And that's what this candidacy is about. And, and fundamentally, that's about what reclaiming our democracy looks like. Really putting people first. What, what does that mean? And that's what Michiganders want, and, and that's what I'm hearing everywhere I go. When you talk to people and they say, my representative doesn't represent me, is part of that a function of the fact that in this state and in this country, about 50% of the people will disagree with their elected official because they have an R or a D after their name. And is some of that division also sown by that news that those members are watching coming out of silos that are 
similar to echo chambers that talk about the network that they pick to choose to listen to their point of view or to this point of view and Americans do the same kind of thing and kind of stay separated? Yes, I, I, you're absolutely right. Everywhere I go, I talk about this very thing and I ask this, this exact question uh, all over Michigan. I say, do you find it odd that working class white folks in Michigan, particularly working class white males, at almost an 80 to 90 percent rate have been convinced to vote for one party and working class black folks or black males have been convinced to vote for another party. Even though their economic interests are very similar, even though um, what they'd like to see happen in their communities are very similar, safety, security, uh, good, good education, what is that about? So you're absolutely right, the, the, the weaponization of information to convince folks to even vote against their own self-interest at times is real. And so how do we take that on? You take it on by saying, you know what? I want to represent you and your best interests. And it's not about the party, it's about the people. And folks don't say that enough. And when they say it, they don't actually mean it. Why? I believe because it's about maintaining incumbent power on both sides, particularly federally. What do I mean by that? The barriers to entry are erected so, so high, particularly as it relates to money in, in, in campaigns, federally, that it creates very little opportunity for someone to compete uh, for an incumbent seat. That's why people have been calling for uh, uh, term limits and things like that. If you actually had true competitive races, you wouldn't need term limits at all because folks would be able to compete and do that. We have an open Senate seat in Michigan for the first time in, you know, was, what, 20 some years. This is an amazing opportunity for Michigan to really think about what type of leadership do they want? And do they want new voices, fresh voices, and new leadership that represents everybody and the people's interest over corporate interest, over lobbyist interest, and over traditional government politics that we've fallen into today? And so, to me, it's about breaking through. Um, I'm running in the Democratic primary, so I definitely have to communicate and talk to the Democratic voter first. But after we win that primary, we're going to be running in a general election to represent all of Michigan. And I want to talk to all the voters here. That's why I'm going everywhere. Some people said, Hill, um, there aren't enough Democrats in that county. Why are you going? I want to talk to everybody there because I want to be the, the senator for all of Michigan. In fact, that's something we don't talk about enough, unifying Michigan. If you think about it, and I'll tell you a story. I was actually, it was, it was depressing. I went to... Uh, Tigers opening day this, this, this year, and it was actually, the weather was nice. Not that the Tigers are depressing, you know, I don't want to, if you love the Tigers, I love, I wanted the Tigers to win. They didn't make the playoffs this year, but soon, soon, soon. Uh, <laughs> but just looking at Tigers opening day, all these people tailgating. Tailgating is one of Michigan's great traditions. And there were black folks tailgating in Detroit, and then there were white folks. They were eating the same hot dogs, drinking the same beer, laughing, but none of, nobody was doing it together. If you really think about the level of segregation in Michigan, it's very high. And I want us to come together. The best version of Michigan is a unified Michigan. And the best version of the United States of America is a unified America. Michigan is one of the most diverse states in this country. And we need to partner together, work together. I met with a small farmer outside of Midland, and he literally said the same thing to me about health care that a single black mom in Detroit who lived at the corner of Mack and Drexel said. Those two folks, politically, you'd think, are completely different. The Midland white small far farmer, male, and this single mom in Detroit. Yet they both had 
both had the exact same concerns about health care and the, and the cost of it and the fact that it's the number one cause of personal bankruptcies and the fact that they're choosing between paying for their, their meds and, and, and paying their mortgage or their rent. These are real issues facing everybody in Michigan. And I want to be the person that helps represent both of those people and actually create some solutions. When we come back, uh, look at 20 years ago this week when we began with To The Point. It was 20 years ago this week that this program, To The Point, first aired. When we began, there was some question of what a show like this would look like and how long you could sustain getting high-profile principals to talk about the important issues of the day. During the first year of the show, any concerns were put to rest as we had an abundance of great topics and guests. I still remember having some trepidation as we started that first week. Our guest on October 25th, 2003, were two members of the State House of Representatives, Republican Jerry Coyman and Democrat Michael Sack. They became the first of a long line of House members and members from the Senate as well to join us on a regular basis. It wasn't just at the state level, but U.S. representatives from West Michigan. While new faces have replaced all of the members we had on that first year, we have continued to keep in close contact with and have frequent visits from our representatives in Washington. That first year included another high-profile member of Congress, well, frankly, Rick, I Texas Representative Tom DeLay, at the time the majority leader for the Republicans. We have immediate crisis today. Likewise, U.S. Senators continue to visit the show. In that first year, Senator Debbie Stabenow and Senator Carl Levin, of course, but that's not all. Remember, 2003 was the eve of a presidential campaign, and there were other senators who hoped to move down the street to Pennsylvania Avenue from the Capitol to the White House, including Kerry, Edwards, McCain, and others. How big is the Iraq war going Even one former senator who was indeed a presidential candidate himself more than 30 years earlier, former Senator George McGovern, was our guest. The two hottest topics of the first year, and indeed the first few years, were one, the Iraq war and all the questions that surrounded it. For one of those conversations, we had as our guest the Vice President of the United States, Dick Cheney, who quickly dismissed one of the hotly debated issues going into that 2004 presidential election. Senator Kerry told us on this program just last week that he believed the president misled the American people in going to war in Iraq. Did the president mislead the American people? Of course not. I think uh, anybody who looks at it, looks at uh, Saddam Hussein and the regime uh, he ran. This is one of the bloodiest dictatorships of the 20th century. They started two wars. He produced and used weapons of mass destruction against the Kurds and against the Iranians. He uh, provided safe haven, uh, safe harbor for terrorists. Uh, for uh, Abu Nidal, for the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. He provided $25,000 payments to the families of suicide bombers who would kill Israelis, and he had an established relationship with al-Qaeda. This was a very evil man. The other big issue that dominated the show through the remainder of the decade, the state budget. Governor Jennifer Granholm was a frequent guest and early on hoped to find common ground and come to an agreement on how to trim spending facing an ongoing structural deficit in the state. The things we don't agree on, I hope, will fall to the side so that we can focus on the common ground in the middle because it is so critical in this state that we grow jobs. How realistic is it that all of these things that you talked about, all of these plans you can do, now you say there will have to be more spending, but there won't be any raise in spending. In other words, there won't be additional costs. For these proposals, uh, we are not going to seek additional general fund revenue. We are just going to refocus, and a lot of them are no-cost proposals. or proposals That turned that out to be much more difficult than she hoped, and the argument over the budget during that period became epic. All of that and so much more, including returning to Washington to remember the life and legacy of an American president whose impact is still felt today when we covered the funeral of President Ronald Reagan. After that first year, we were off and running, and for a thousand shows, give or take a few, we've been bringing you the important topics from decision makers from Washington to Lansing and beyond. And thanks to you for watching, we'll continue into the future. For the next few weeks in this final segment, we'll take a couple of minutes to look back over two decades of To The Point.
As we celebrate our 20th anniversary, and like always, I hope you'll join us every week. To the point.